something like a treasure. Can you picture that? Can you picture that? Welcome, everyone. My name's Heather. I will be your host today, but really, I just get to sit back and relax today for our very special presentation, Picturing Wonderland, featuring Abelardo Morel and Diane Wagner. I'm the Vice President of the Lewis Carroll Society of North America, and I also get to organize these events every month with my fellow Senior Common Room Curators, the Virtual Events Committee. But enough of me. Let's, let's get to our, our esteemed presenters. Abelardo Morel was born in Havana, Cuba and immigrated to the US in 1962. He is an award-winning photographer and artist. His awards include a Guggen Guggenheim Fellowship and an Infinity Award. You've probably seen his art hanging in places such as, oh, I don't know, the Museum of Modern Art, the Whitney Museum of American Art, or the Metropolitan Art Museum in New York. Now he We'll be talking to Diane Wagner, who a lot of you know. I believe the last time Diane spoke to us was maybe April 2021 at the USC hosted virtual conference, I think. Now she's a curator of photographs at the National Gallery of Art, where she has curated numerous exhibitions. She published a book that might be of interest to some of you in 2020, Lewis Carroll's Photography and Modern Childhood with Princeton University Press. And she currently serves on the board of the Lewis Carroll Society of North America. So let's give a warm welcome to Abe and Diane. And you can both go ahead and unmute yourselves, show your faces. There we go. Hi, Abe. Hi. Hi, Diane. Hi. Welcome. Hi. So I'm I'm gonna make myself scarce and, and leave it to you guys. If you need anything, I'm here, but otherwise I will just be keeping track of these audience questions and I'll see you when you're done. Okay, great. Well, thank you, um, Heather, for that introduction. And I'm really excited to be here with Abe um, because I have long been a fan of his photography. Um, so to get started, I've just asked Abe if he can begin by telling us a little bit more about his practice as an artist as a whole, because I think when you see his work, you will definitely see the connections to um, his work with the Alice books, um, with his longtime fascination with the camera obscura, uh, creating dreamscapes, um, playing with disorientation, and really making the everyday magical. So Abe, if you want to share your screen and get started, please go ahead. So uh, thank you. Thank you for, for uh, Heather for inviting me and Diane, who I'm looking forward to speaking with. Uh, I love her work, including her amazing book on Lewis Carroll's photography, which is has made me realize some new stuff about uh, his genius, not just as a writer, but as an artist and thinker. So um, the uh, some of the work that I've been doing in the last 30 years or so uh, includes work that in some ways is is connected to, to Alice in Wonderland. Uh, I've always been remotely kind of indirectly influenced by that work, but never quite exactly knowing how. But here's some early work of mine that uh, I think touches on my affinity with with his imagery and thinking. Uh, my, my kids, uh, a long time ago, uh, sort of floating in the air. Uh, a long time ago, I, I kind of invented this method of photographing camera obscures, images from the outside coming into the room naturally, Empire State Building, New York City. Uh, these are all naturally done uh, through uh, special optics, but it's, uh, it's a topsy-turvy world that is made from real sources. Uh, this is in Venice as well. Um, over the years, I've worked a lot on these uh, installations of, of sorts. Paris upside down. Uh, those have been making pictures of flowers. Actually, I have a book called Flowers for Lisa, who is my wife. And I made, I made 76 photographs of flowers dedicated to her. And I wanted to be as inventive as possible. So these this is a sampling of some of these pictures that, again, have a kind of an Alice feel to them. Not exactly directly, but indirectly the creation of space that doesn't is not real but it's implied 
Yeah, right. and I think when we see your Alice pictures, there's you definitely see the connection, particularly with the looking glass ones, with this kind of play with planes and um, dimensionality and so on. Yeah, very much. I, and I, I'm, 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 I'm pre, um, I'm, I'm getting ahead of myself, but this this could be Humpty Dumpty uh, without my thinking it totally clearly. Uh, I've also made lots of made up in, in wood constructions as if I was a child myself, but creating impossible spaces made from real things. I mean, one of the things I really admire about Lewis Carroll is what a precise mind he had. He was quite inventive, uh, wild even, but maybe because of his mathematical background, but his precision in naming the craziness, it was so well done that we believe in his wacky worlds. Uh, this is a new work that I'm doing where I'm projecting a landscape nearby onto a, a tent that I made where the landscape across the way it gets projected on the ground and I photograph it on the ground. Sorry, it's more complicated than than, than that, but this is what it looks like, uh, a little Alice-like. Uh, so this is a picture of a garden uh, projected onto pebbles. So this combination of two worlds coming together is what I'm interested in. More of that. Again, they're all naturally done, although they feel totally invented. You see the stones and, and the sky. Uh, so this uh, idea of, of finding the world and making it wonderful <laughs> uh, has been with me since I began photography. And of course, uh, Lewis Carroll has always been there for me in one way or another. Uh, including I went to college in 1967 when people were doing drugs a lot, uh, psychedelics. Uh, I, I was not into that because I was too afraid of, of the weirdness of it. But in 1967, uh, Jefferson Airplane came out with White Rabbit. So Alice was in the air when I was a freshman, but in terms of just uh, drugs. But I obviously had an idea who Lewis Carroll was. Um, Abe, can you tell us a little bit about when you first encountered the actual Alice books? What was your introduction to them? Did you come across them as a child in Cuba? Was it later when you were an adult? Or was it one of the film adaptations that you first encountered? Clearly, Jefferson Airplane was one of the first encounters <laughs> with Alice. But yeah, yeah. When did I'm you not... first see the books or see a movie based on the stories? Yeah, I, I don't have a memory of uh, finding a book in Cuba. My, my parents didn't have books or art. Uh, and so I'm not sure that I would have found them in any library, uh, but I'm sure that I knew the legend of uh, Alice in Wonderland. Uh, it, but it was in 67 where the, the idea of a dreamy Alice and drug taking and worlds being kind of uh, upside down was in the air, uh, so I, but and that was that's not a very deep connection to her. But uh, it was in 1998 that someone someone actually approached me to see if I wanted to do an illustrated version of Alice in Wonderland, uh, and I hadn't really thought about it. But then I began to think, and uh, in 1998, my daughter was quite; she was seven years old. Um, she was sort of a hero, a heroine of mine. Because I, I think of Alice now as a kind of a, a strong uh, heroine who didn't put up with stuff. Uh, she was strong, but open-minded as well. She was willing to open some door and go in, in there. And so that ability for her to, to be open to, to new experiences. And then my daughter being a heroine of mine, she, was, she didn't put up with stuff, uh, made, made, made the 
the idea of, of illustrating her even stronger. And of course, I used Tenniel's illustrations, which there's no one better uh, to my mind. So I wanted to keep that base uh, strong. This is some some early illustrations that where I was playing around with the idea of creating something newly coherent. Uh, and this is what one of the pictures came out of that, uh, lighting her in a theatrical, almost operatic way. But it was, it was fun to arrange these theaters, little theaters, um, to, to create a kind of a, a, a link to the story itself. I didn't want to invent everything. I wanted to stick with uh, Lewis Carroll's story and Tenniel's drawings of them. Can you talk a little bit more about why Tenniel, you think, um, you know, has never been surpassed? Why did he, did the Tenniel illustrations appeal to you so much? It's, um, maybe it's just our uh, ancient memory that we have in our brain. You know, maybe the first ones that I've ever seen were Tenniel in some ways that they, they feel like the beginning. Uh, but I do, I do think that uh, when people try too hard to beat Tenniel, it looks it looks silly. <laughs> so I uh, I do trust the the wisdom that Lewis Carroll had about using Tenniel and some sense of embodying the story with with his illustrations. They just feel right to me. Right, but you brought so much of yourself to the Tenniel illustrations. Oh my God! Yes, no. no I, for example, this one. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, I. You know, I mean, Tenniel is it. flat on the page, right? It's, <laughs> you know, they're drawings. You are a photographer, and you're someone who plays with optical devices and so on. Correct. Uh, you know, and this one is a great example of it. This is one of my favorite pictures from the Alice in Adventures in Wonderland because um, it kind of just says it all. You've got. You, you know, I know that you've talked about how the book is so important, particularly in the Alice's Adventures in Wonderland set of pictures, you know, and here, you, of course, you've chosen to use a dictionary, so it's yeah, so funny, yeah. you know, given Carol's play on words, but I, I want to know a little bit more about how you actually made this particular photograph, I mean, obviously, if this is a studio practice, you're setting up these little stage sets in the studio, but I love the fact that you put in the rabbit hole here, because, of course, Tenniel never illustrated the rabbit hole itself. He never did. Right. 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 So even though I said I adore Tenniel uh, as an artist, uh, as, as a good artist, you want to, yes, be influenced, but you also want to do better. Right. In some ways, I, I, wanted, I took Tenniel and ran with it in a way that created space for myself. Uh, yeah, so I, this is, I mean, I, I may have had a dream about this, but the idea of uh, the rabbit going down a hole is such a significant uh, image. But I thought in some ways, I had been photographing books for a while at this point. The idea of going deep into a book uh, felt like part of what Alice is all about, knowledge. You, you go in and you take knowledge for good or for bad, but you, you open yourself to new experiences. And so in some ways, this hole, which I hire someone to drill me a big hole. Uh, so you actually drilled things. a hole into the book. Yes, it was fun, actually. <laughs> uh, um, and, I, and I love the shards come out of it, too. I mean, knowledge yeah. coming out in bits. Um, you must have a light in there because... Yes, there's a light, yeah. To me, it looks, you know, kind of looks like almost a can light, you know, so I, I, it, there's something that so draws you towards it, you know, so you, you could feel like that white rabbit is about to leap in there, the idea that Alice is going to come out along and want to leap in there because th that it almost looks like a vortex um, that's going to suck you in. It's a little scary. Yeah. But I <laughs> yeah, there's something a little right? menacing about it as well Absolutely. as delightful and attractive. I mean, I, but I do still think that in some ways this is an allusion to the way knowledge can be uh, a, a chancy thing, you know? You learn and you find some things that may not be all that good for you. But anyway, it was a good start for me to think, okay, the idea is books provide a, a, a world into which 
imagination can happen. So uh, more books, I used uh, more books in, in telling the story, uh, huge dictionaries. Uh, the idea of- But I love the fact you've also incorporated the chessboard as well in this one and the previous one with the yes. Mad Hatter's Tea Party. And it almost looks like the pieces of the tea set are pieces on the, the board, you know, so you're kind of, of course you're hinting at what's to come with the second book. That's what I was hoping for, and thank you. That uh, works. And this idea of, you know, when this is a part when she takes a certain uh, substance and then she gets bigger, and I so I built this giant uh, tall thing, but um, and I love the shadow of Alice onto the books. And years ago, someone asked me what I thought about what the shadow was. And I still remember my answer, which was, it's a way of representing the crooked path to knowledge. I said that and I went, who said that? <laughs> it was me. <laughs> but in, in some ways it does represent that crookedness of learning some stuff. Um, so, uh, and, and this is not Alice in Wonderland, but this is another other picture of mine where the, my idea of uh, Babylon of books uh, is an image that keeps recurring in my mind. More, this is not Alice. This is uh, Alice within books being either stuck in a book uh, or you know trying to get out, but a book being a kind of a complicit to her movements. Yeah, it seems like this is one where she's I mean, she's about to burst out of the book. And I, so I love how you've transformed the white rabbit's house into the literal book. Um, yes. That she, she's, she's, you know, over, she's growing out of it, right? Yeah, she's too, she's too big for it. Well, in some ways, part of my thesis about knowledge, uh, sometimes confining you to a certain space, you know, uh, this is where she cries too much. Uh, so again, the book is leaking some water. Uh, some little kids see this as not tears, but something else. I'm not going to mention it. Right. <laughs> <laughs> That's clearly not what you were doing, though. No, no not at all. <laughs> and I, you know, when I showed these pictures to young kids, they had all kinds of wild uh, readings. Um, so these were really fun because I had to construct a little theater, you know, make a book that suggested a garden. And it was actually fun. It was not the kind of work that I had done before, fabricating little theaters, but it was rather fun. And to be in some little corner, making things up like a mini theater. Uh, more books on the top. Again, all these are cutouts from Tenniel's illustrations, literally. So in every instance, in order to make these pictures, you were making a construction in the studio, right? And then photographing correct. that. Correct, correct. Uh, I'm gonna show you some of the transformations that I made from the original to you know my version of them. So this is uh, this huge you know, chess game in the field. Uh, and, and so, my take on it, which is taking the original chess feel and and creating a kind of a a weird kaleidoscope out of them, enlarging even uh, the strangeness of, of the, the the scape. Well, so here we're moving from Alice's Adventures in Wonderland into through the Looking Glass. Right? Yes, both. Yeah, uh, in and out. So they're not all through the uh, through the looking glass, but you're right. It's I'm changing uh, books in in mid stride. <laughs> um, so I would look at something like this, which I, I love the image, but the idea of how do I make something interesting out of this, which Tenniel did beautifully, and one of my strategies, and actually in a number of pictures, was to like Picasso, perhaps break up space to give it a kind of a new sense of drama. In this case, this is, I did. So the, 
the deer itself has been chopped in half. I mean, it's a little upsetting, but uh, what was somewhat normal now feels like it's still part of the, the story, but in a new space, which interests me. Uh, well, it's, so, very fra it's very fractured and it's bringing in that psychedelic aspect, right? Absolutely, absolutely. Um, going back yeah. to Jefferson Airplane. Yes. Uh, again, I I'm not I wasn't a drug taker back then or even now. Uh, so I, that it never interested me. You know, worlds that had just craziness and no logic and all that. I've always, again, like Lewis Carroll, I think had a very precise mind, and his psychedelics were rather much more interesting to me than Jefferson Airplane. Uh, one of the beginnings. Uh, through the looking glass uh, and and in some cases what I did was to take sections of the illustrations by Tenniel and create wallpapers um, invented wallpapers but based on the illustrations themselves to create rooms and spaces that had you know some affinity to the original but uh, a, a new way of looking at it well, in this one, I if you can go back, I also love, I mean, clearly there's the theme of the kaleidoscope here and the way you created these wallpapers. And I love the fact that you've also made, you know, you've got Alice splitting into two here, like she's going to become part of a kaleidoscope. And that's, uh, you know, kind of a harbinger of what's about to happen to her as she's going to go through the looking glass. And, you know, this constant theme of doubling that's that's going to happen in the story going forward. You, you got it, exactly. I wanted this floating Alice having two faces, one in one world, one in the other. Uh, that is a constant preoccupation of mine, how to make this doubleness, double entry into the reality, something interesting. Uh, like double mirrors. Here we go. Uh, this is not exactly a mirror, but the feel like the illustration of, of these two creatures that they're mirroring each other uh, in this uh, beach. So in that that theme kind of is present in a lot of the pictures, uh, including a mirror where the lobster is looking at itself, but the mirror is not exactly a precise, uh, you know, rendering of it. Uh, I mean. <laughs> I'm going down the rabbit hole a lot, but keeping and using a lot of my uh, artistic imagination, really fun because I trust it to, to go all the way down and still be interesting. Yeah, but so the two uh, illustrations that you just showed us, those are from Alice's Adventures in Wonderland. Yes. They are ones that you made later. Um, we haven't really talked about the fact that you first approached Alice's Adventures in Wonderland in 1998. And those are all the black and white images with the theme of the book. And then you returned to it in 2020, where primarily you were doing through the looking glass, but you went back and you redid some, some additional um, images for Alice's Adventures in Wonderland, like this one. and. Um, the previous one, and I see a huge difference between, you know, the way you were approaching the story um, uh, with uh, obviously the construction of these, um, you know, little set pieces with Alice and the black and white, but clearly, you know, you're using all the doubling and creating these wallpapers and so on with the color images later on in 2020. But I wonder if you can talk about sort of like where you were as an artist between those that, that time period, and certainly I'm imagining the fact that you came back to it in 2020 is very significant because of course it was in the middle of the pandemic. And I do feel a really kind of, a much more sort of claustrophobic sense with the ones <laughs> that you made for Through the Looking Glass than for Alice's Adventures in Wonderland. I, that's perceptive and I think you're right. In, in, in uh, 1998, I was at a certain stage in my life um, where I was, I think I was constrained by my artistic brain, you know, and I, I had one way of making pictures for Alice. And, and looking back at some of those early Alice pictures, I wasn't happy with what came out. So I took several 
images from that beginning uh, and replace them with new versions of them. Uh, and I really, uh, I mean, it's like, it's like putting a 15 year old in one picture and putting a 50 year old in the other. There's two different brains involved. The new brain I love because it knows more, it's better, and it's a little wackier. <laughs> and COVID was in 2020 when I began to re to to finish the project. I mean, everyone knows what that's about, and I was stuck inside, uh, thinking the world is falling apart, and um, and what better model to have in terms of dealing with something difficult than Alice. I mean, Lewis Carroll provided a setting in which this young girl experienced a lot of topsy-turvy, a lot of strangeness and, uh, you know, uh, even fear. Uh, but she, you know, she never quite, you know, submits to that. She always finds ways to overcome it or even question authority. Um, so she's like a great model for being in the middle of something that makes no sense. So uh, with that knowledge in mind, I, my artistic muscles began to work even more. And, and of course my sense of design uh, in the new ones, the new versions just began to, I don't know, go to town. You know, I got better. I mean, who, who can say, you know, from 1998 to 2020, well, I could have gotten worse. I don't think I did. No. <laughs> uh, but this is early picture of, of my son, Brady. Uh, the kind of work I was doing when he was a child. And this preoccupation with a self, you know, what is the self? What is the person? Is there a duplicate of that, of you? Uh, and and this, they they really speak to each other. This sense of who's who, uh, how is a mirror image of someone not the same? Uh, all those issues, uh, I think, came in to help in making these pictures. Another double this. Well, in this one, I want to pause um, because you've done a, a sort of a positive and negative in inverse here. So it feels very photographic. <laughs> oh God, yeah. I mean, if anything, I'm a photographer for, forever, right. for life. But the idea of making a negative out of the, out of the white rabbit, uh, I mean, thank you for getting it. Some people don't understand what's happening here. But a white rabbit can be also a black rabbit in photography. Uh, so it, it has that quote uh, to the process itself. And, and Lewis Carroll was an ultimate uh, a professional. I mean, I, I love his pictures because they're so precise and so well lit and so well arranged that uh, he was pretty masterful right from the beginning. And I just, I love him as a model for kind of a creating scenes that work. Right, it's a great gesture to him as a photographer too. Very much. Uh, other liberties I've taken, this is, uh, I'll show you what I did with this picture. This is when she has drunk something to make her tall so she can get the key. Um, so, um, you know, the, these decisions that I made uh, uh, just come out of the id. I don't know where it comes from sometimes. But I wanted a sense of the key in there is a real small, real key being lit. So I wanted the reality of the, of the key to be present, to not be forgotten, that that's her goal. Um, and in this case, I took everything but her out, made a wallpaper uh, from the train itself, and just had a, a white cut out of her, almost a, a ghost of, of Alice. Uh, but in some ways, her meekness, there's a certain kind of shyness there that I wanted to uh, elevate in this picture. This is a, a wallpaper I made 
from the scene when a lot of drums are going on in the background and she's had it with it. Uh, so I used th this wallpaper of drums in this scene where I made it a small room for her to actually be saying, stop, it's deafening. Uh, but the wallpaper itself is a visual element of that noise. Yeah, well, here, that's one of the ones where I really see the kind of claustrophobia coming in. Yeah, oh, yeah, it's not pleasant. No, for sure. Uh, it's not all fun and games. And this is a major picture for me because the idea of, of Humpty Dumpty is such a attractive image of a strange egg talking to you, but he's really on a very thin balance there. Um, I have tons of notes on Alice before I made the pictures. Lots of notes. I don't even know if they make sense anymore. But I did study things like how thin is that edge? You know, uh, made me think about it. You know, it made me consider what uh, strategies I had to use. This is one of them. N not show Humpty Dumpty, but Alice in a kind of a translucent way but I love her almost ballet like feeling of elevating herself to to touch Humpty Dumpty it's very elegant then the idea of Humpty Dumpty falling onto a glass that's fractured uh very much meaningful of of a certain breaking of reality right and of course the theme of the looking glass itself Totally looking glass, yes. And in this case, it's just, I wanted to be almost as abstract as I could be. It's just a mirror on a wall. Um, well, this is I, interesting because this is one of your few where you don't use tenuel at all. No, this is totally me. And I wanted this almost modern art vision of, of Alice, where it has a kind of a... Uh, Lichtenstein uh, painting yes. uh, creating a kind of a balance and this is just a shadow of something on the edge and that uh, kind of imbalance is part of the meaning of that Humpty Dumpty scene you know somebody's going to have to put this thing back together again an early picture of mine so that sense of instability has always been with me or creating a kind of an impossible motion uh, of an object. This is not Alice, this is an early picture of mine where I wanted to, in one book, narrate a story in several pages, seen all at once. This is the White Knight, which, um, and I, I created something like the other picture where I cut scenes, uh, discrete scenes, and I made them into walls so that what we're looking at is entry into four or five different theaters. So the reality is based on something close and something far, and it's it's broken up like the mirror in the previous picture. Yeah, it looks like it's like the carnival distortion, right? Yes, yes, very much. Very yeah. fractured. And you don't know where the reality is. I still wanted to keep Alice on the right, kind of looking at this. Um, this is uh, the original. And in some cases, I, I actually had cards falling on her. It took about 100 shots to get it right. <laughs> so you were dropping these? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, them. with a strobe and no, 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 no. Right. And at this point, I, I, I didn't ask before, were you using a digital camera or was this still a film camera? The, the new work is the digital the new camera. new work, I'm sure, is digital. but Yeah, the old one, no. It's uh, a film camera. It's, but it's digital only in the sense that it captures what I show it. Uh, and none of those these pictures that I made with the digital camera, am I adding anything extra? It's not like I mean I'm adding dragons or anything like that. It's my camera's trained on 
what's in front of it. So I don't use it to invent, uh, you know, wholly new realities. I'm not interested in that. You know, people who put clowns in the sky, this is very boring to me. So these are straight pictures with a digital camera. Uh, my son uh, being taken to heaven. I don't know what. And just weird. There's a certain kind of action like that. And anyway, here's another one. Alice being kind of upset and disturbing a dinner table. Uh, and by creating a kind of a wallpaper, stimulating fireworks, uh, it felt like it described the scene very well. And I'm almost done here. Um, this is the beginning of Through the Looking Glass, where she goes into a room that where things are backwards. This is my picture of it, a strobe, a flash with water. And I'd really like the idea of that liquidy reality being pierced by her, because it feels like that. You, you're going in, uh, and it's not a solid thing, but a malleable thing. And this is her coming out into that presumably new world. Uh, pictures of mine that relate to that idea of crossing one threshold into another. One, one piece is mirror, one piece is glass, uh, confining, you know, uh, defining reality in very flexible ways. Same thing here. Again, this is not Alice pictures. Where yeah, mirror I, love, might... I love the use of the water as the way that the looking glass dissolves. It, oh yeah, it's, it's, a, it's, it's a, really beautiful. The malleable reality. This is not a mirror, this is a, a glass, but I wanted to confuse the issue of that, um, where uh, the realities being formed are not quite understood. And I, clearly this is uh, going into a very weird mirror, but it's all real. It's not, this is not made up in Photoshop. It's, I, I wanted to photograph real things. Well, so here you put you put um, the uh, chessboard or checkerboard together, right? In the studio. I created a building. <laughs> yeah, I created a small building. But you created kind of an infinity space a little bit, right? Yeah, or co correct. Regression or whatever it's called. Uh, but this, again, this is another one of the looking glass pictures where you don't use tenuel at all. No, no. And I I guess I wanted to take that liberty too. And this is, the, so, so uh, I'm going to end here because this picture of Alice willingly too, no one is forcing her to do this, willingly going into this other world. It's such a great example of curiosity, which is as art as an artist I have, and I love her for doing it. You don't know what's going to happen, but all kinds of new findings happen for the good or for the bad. Uh, but it's such a, a great model of uh, what we need more of today. People are afraid to do certain things these days because they might be hurt or whatever. I'm for, I'm with her. Something is interesting. Let me go to it. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Abe. Um... Just a couple more questions. Um, I know you've mentioned that you were thinking about Lewis Carroll and his interest in precision and mathematics and so on. So in addition to reading the Alice books at some point, did you kind of dive into Lewis Carroll's biography and his Victorian world? Of course, I'd have to ask if you looked at his photography. Was that also part of the kind of in the mix for you as you were creating these pictures? I, I actually try to do some of the math stuff that he wrote and um, I'm a dummy. Uh, my brain is not so good for that stuff. So I, I appreciated his his sense of elegance and math. Uh, but just knowing that he actually had that kind of mind helped me. He, I love his photography very much. Because um, he, he had a very strong sense of how to make reality work in photography. Not everyone had that kind of gift. But he just could get a lighting, a space, a certain moment in someone's look that really worked. 
so I mean, it's enviable. A, a, a mathematician, a great writer, an artist. I mean, he had he had it all in some ways. So there's a lot to pick from. Um, and then I guess my last question before we um, open it up to others' questions is just if anybody wanted to acquire any of your photographs, uh, where would they go? And also, I, can you tell us about the planned exhibition of your Alice pictures that is coming up? Oh, thank you. Um, my I have a gallery in New York City uh, and in, in Boston as well, but in New York City is Edwin Houck, H-O-U-K gallery, and they represent me. Uh, and for any inquiries about this work or any other work, uh, I will go to that. Um, there is a, an organization called Mid-America Alliance, Arts Alliance, that's putting together a traveling show of my all my Alice photographs, I think 38 or 40 of them. And they're beginning to book uh, tra a traveling show of that work, uh, different institutions, different places. So stay tuned for a pitch by them to see if your local museum or library might be interested in the work. But that's coming up uh, in the next six months. Great. Thanks for the plug. Okay, well, um, Heather, should we move on to questions from the audience? Yes, but I get to go first because that's oh. you know, my privilege as host. I loved seeing your notes on the, on the one slide there. That was amazing. I actually ran to the attendance list here because Michael Hancher comes to some of our events. And I'm like, oh, does he see the yeah. shout out? But he's not here. Um, I'm wondering what other books you've used for research or just to expand your your knowledge of oh, the annotated Alice. Annotated Alice. Yeah. Good choice. That was uh, in, including the new one. I think right. that, yeah, no, so I, I kept up with that. That was uh, rather important to me because uh, maybe not visually all the time, but in terms of a reference to a, a book or a literary piece, uh, mm -hmm. helped a lot to just get into the mindset of uh, Lewis Carroll and Tenniel's worlds. Excellent. And I know that's, especially that new one, that's something a lot of us refer Amazing. to quite a bit. And this isn't a question that we would ask in front of any other audience, but I know a lot of people are going to be able to picture whatever you say. Do you I'm a have Virgo. A I'm a Virgo. <laughs> no, sorry. How did you know? How did you know that's where I was going? <laughs> I'm wondering if you have a favorite of Lewis Carroll's photographs, if there's one that just stops you in your tracks, the, the composition model what whichever is there is there one that really stands out to you or is it, it just overall maybe it's uh because i know it but his first photograph of uh, alice little um feels very poignant to me hmm. uh just seeing the reality of that young girl and what came of her you know in his uh, brain it's it's a very potent um linking of reality and imagination. Good choice. Not not as famous as the other ones, like the beggar girl or whatnot, but yeah. Yeah, are you talking about the sort of tiny one where she's just, she's very young? Yes, yeah, a tiny one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah. He, he I mean, it just, her sister Lorena at the same time. Historically, it just feels like, it's like seeing a picture of Adam in the garden. <laughs> yeah. You know, yes. like, yeah, I can see that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's the start of it all, right? Exactly. So back to, I did I call it or what? Like I knew the first questions would be, how do we get our hands on these images? <laughs> we, we have some further questions about that. Uh, do you ever tour the UK and Europe? Is is that a possibility in the future? Uh, tour it in what oh, way? We'll tour your, your, your work, like your exhibits. I, I, I've had shows in England and in France and places like that, but... Uh, the Alice work, not so much, um, although I'm hoping that with this um, Mid-America Arts Alliance sh shows, something may happen there. But uh, yeah, that's, I hope. So no immediate plans, but it has. Uh, but not, has yet. not yet. There is this book from of, uh, the first round of the Alice's Adventures in Wonderland. 
Thank you. Series, not through the looking glass. And of course, will there be a looking glass book? Is that in the well? Um, I was about to say in the cards, that's more of a Wonderland reference. I've been in I've been in touch with a couple of um, printers, yeah, p publishers, and there is some interest in the idea of this traveling show uh, with both Alice and Through the Looking Glass uh, being a book. So there's 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 interest. So my hope is that when that show travels. It will have with it a book. Excellent. Jill Treasure is wondering, do you play chess? No, I'm terrible. <laughs> that would be my answer as well. And well, here here is a fabulous question to end on. Arnold Hershon asked, with over with editions being or over 1600. <laughs> Illustrated editions. Why do you think so very few of the editions are based on photography versus drawing or painting? Any thoughts on that? Yeah, it's still that it's old uh, belief uh, that photography ain't art, you know. Um, so maybe some of that. Uh, and of course, we've we've taken care of that question many, many years already ago. So uh, I, I like the idea of a photographer uh, making images of a photographer's work, um, which is very, feels very, you know, apropos. Excellent. And I wanted to mention before we go, everybody, I'm putting in the chat here, um, that's a link to the email that sent, we sent out this morning. There will be a social hour right now and Diane and Abe will be attending at least for a little while. So we can kind of have more of an extended Q&A there if you wanna ask them any questions in person. And I did want to address uh, someone in the chat just asked me about uh, something they're curating and how could they maybe uh, arrange an event about it. And believe me, I love it when events fall into my lap like this one did here. Diane said, hey, I've got this great artist here, Abe. Why don't we speak to him? So please uh, email me at, it's a mouthful, lcsna social media at outlook.com or you can reach out to us uh, via any of our, our, our social media as well. But yeah, Dana, I would love to talk to you about that. Absolutely. And yeah, Abe, Diane, thank you so much. This was such a treat for everyone, including me. I got to just like sit back and enjoy and listen to you discuss this. And we'll see everybody at Social Hour in just a minute. Thanks so much, everyone. Thank you, Heather. Great. Bye. Bye. Thank you.